The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. So we're back. It's another week in pandemic world. I uh, went out to get food for the first time in a couple of weeks uh, using one of these homemade chopped up t-shirt masks. It was sort of strange. Didn't see that many masks out there in the world. Things are still going to be changing pretty quick here, I think. In the T2 Tile project last week, I announced the uh, formation of the Living Computation Foundation. Uh, um, now, a couple of quick updates. There's a a chat room, a chat subroom on the Gitter, uh, specifically for the living computation stuff. Uh, it's got the mission statement, and Andrew Walpole, who's been doing so much great stuff, uh, uh, has been uh, putting up possibilities for uh, different versions of the logo, other possible logos. Uh, you know. Uh, these things that uh, he's got an explanation for him. He's got the sort of sort of a sun thing for life and the input output links and stuff like that. I'm not sure. I'm still I'm trying to let it grow on me. <laughs> uh, um, and also for a logo type, the stylized form of the abbreviation LCF Living Computation Foundation uh, that Shirley will need as well. And he's got these two that I, I kind of like. I think there's some uh, uh, some potential for these things with the F kind of going off like a little flame of life or something like that and everything all getting packed together there's lots of stuff going on thank you andrew uh, uh another uh, andrew as well was contributing to the discussion thank you and i encourage everybody especially if you have any of those inklings uh, uh for you know doing graphics design and stuff like that if you have some experience and you might have some possible uh, uh unfunded mandate for coronavirus shut-ins come take a look see what you think uh, and then, yeah, the, the foundation, the logo as it stands now, not wedded to it, uh, although, you know, I, I need to like it. Whatever it is, I need to like it. Okay, so the main event for today, uh, for this week, uh, is back to intertile events. Um, and, you know, what I didn't want to do was just, you know, sort of show, okay, I, I wrote a bunch of code, top down, starting in the new version, and put on the, die unimplemented, die unimplemented, and then I just started running it. Couldn't open the things to get packets, figured out how to get them open, couldn't do the next step, figured it out, pushed it down, pushed it down, and, and that's a lot of what I've been doing. Uh, um, but again, it's just not very exciting, and I'm not sure it's really very insightful. So what I want to try to do today is push back up to the slightly higher picture, higher level view of intertile events um, and come circle back around to an idea that I've started working on. That this stuff that I'm showing little bits of code here is working on, uh, is, is aiming at. So uh, uh, Kartik uh, Agaram, uh, who we got uh, hooked up with through the Future of Coding Slack, uh, uh, Steve Krause's thing, uh, posted a, a interesting little connection between a couple of different programming languages and architectures on Twitter a week and a half ago, uh, connecting it to the Movable Feast Machine. And he described it as uh, Movable Feast Machine, a tiled processor for very finely grained distributed computation. And that's, that's just right. <laughs> that's a good description. Uh, uh, the the dis distributed part and the fine grain part are both uh, really key. A and what it means, so distributed means you don't have one thing in charge. And fine grain means you have a lot of small things in charge. And that's what makes intertile events so fundamental. When you're using a regular serial computer, there's only one thing happening at a time, or at least the whole system is designed and architected, engineered to let the programmer believe there's only one thing happening at a time, uh, except in specific cases of multi-core and so forth, uh, uh, when there are you know, potentially uh, violations of that general principle of serial uh, uh, execution going on. Uh, and the, having only one thing happen at a time is a tremendous simplification that allows you to reason about things and know this is done before that begins and so forth. Uh, uh, the cost of that wonderfulness, of course, is that, you know, you can only go so fast, you can only get so big, because there's just that one moving finger having written moving on, and many hands make light work, serial doesn't take advantage of that. So, 
If you go the other direction, as we are doing in the T2 Tile project, where we embrace indefinite scalability, anything that's going to keep us from saying we're just going to be able to plug more in, plug more in, we're not going to allow. We're going to rule it out. Indefinite scalability commits us to saying whatever that we're using as our fundamental tile, we'll be able to tile it out as long as we have power, cooling, money to buy tiles, and real estate to lay them out. So that means in exchange for giving up on serial, in getting scalability, we have this coordination problem. How do we get these multiple independent agents to agree uh, so that when something happens, one guy goes, the other guy goes, and they don't both try to go at the same time. They don't end up racing. And I've mentioned this paper before, uh, non-determinism is unavoidable, but data races are pure evil. <laughs> And I love the title because it's so owning it, right? It's just going for it. And and Hans uh, J. Bohm, I don't know him personally, but I know some of the stuff he's done. He did a, a garbage collector for C. He's done a bunch of very good stuff. He's a good guy. I mean, he's, he's a smart guy and, and knows a lot about computer architecture, programming languages, and all that sort of thing. Uh, um, and so it, this was for a workshop in 2012 that I've, I've mentioned sometimes before. And the call for the papers that this workshop was in was saying a, a new school of thought is arising that accepts and embraces non-determinism, including data races. In other words, where you don't know which one is going to actually get in there and get stored because multiple values are heading for a given storage location and you don't know which one is going to get there first and in turn reduce synchronization or even eliminate it completely. And that's what we're facing from the other direction with the T2 tile project where initially we have no synchronization and we have to just try to get what we can get. So the advantage of serial is that it makes everything <laughs> easy to reason about and really or easy to organize. The cost of it is that there's only one thing happening at a time. And as, as soon as you step beyond that and start having multiple things happen at a time, you get terrible bugs and so forth. The flip side is when you don't have a guaranteed serial and you have many, many things happening at once, you have to figure out how to coordinate. You have to figure out how to synchronize. And not just that, uh, you have to, as an additional constraint, it's a separate constraint, you want to have that coordination process process be somehow fair with respect to all of these little tiles rather than just saying I'm king of the back lot and I always get to go first and I always get to do as much as I want that's not going to present a good uh, understandable programming substrate to the programmer on top we need to be able to say that you know yes there are going to be variations in how many events happen and when they happen where it's all randomized but in general there's going to be no no particular area is going to get starved you're, you're happy to be running over there as you are over here because you'll get events over there you'll get events over here that's what being fair is supports so you know one way to think about this is it's like rock paper scissors or something like that where you know each side <laughs> when they're saying who gets to go next i want to go i want to go uh, um that you know each one has the ability to flip the outcome you, you there's nothing that you can pick that the other side can't respond to in some way and, you know, this comes up a, a lot. I want to pick, instead of rock, paper, scissors, this is the one that, that I used when I was a kid, you know, odds and evens. Do you know this one? <clears throat> you know, where, you, where uh, at least according to Wikipedia, you know, you go once, twice, thrice, shoot, and you put out a one or a two, and it, if you're odds and the total is odd, you win. If the total is even, the guy that's got even wins and so forth. Uh, now, <clears throat> I don't know, once twice, thrice, it sounds like Victorian England to me, when I uh, was a kid on Long Island in the 60s, what we said was one strike three, shoot, 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 whatever it was. Uh, um, I guess I can believe that one strike three kind of sounds like a corruption of once, twice, thrice. Uh, uh, but also we were playing Sandlot baseball, so getting strikes and one strike made sense for other reasons. The point is, is that it's not just like the rule of the rock, paper, scissors that each thing has a possible counter move. It's also that you actually need to synchronize just to make the decision. Well, why is that? Because by doing one strike, three, shoot, what you're actually doing is deliberately creating a race. The whole point is that both sides can believe that the other side must have committed to their choice before 
before they saw what the other side did. And that's the exact essence of a race, right? Uh, <coughs> and that, you know, you can't change your mind because they're both in flight at the same time. Through the communication the medium, whatever it happens to be, uh, uh, my two is out there while his one is, uh, is coming in, and we both figure it out in sync. We, we both figure them out in the same group time. We figure them out by racing against each other, and we can both agree on the answer. Odd wins, even wins. So it's not a matter of data races being evil in this context. The data race is the whole point. When you move beyond saying we have a single thread of control, in, when you have a single thread of control, yes, races are evil because it's destroying the illusion of a single point of control. But when you have many points, having a deliberately engineered race is what gives you confidence in the fairness of the algorithm. Okay. Uh, uh, so, what that says is that, you know, in the so, <laughs> all right. So, so here's my protocol. I, I, I've just I've renamed it today. It's the Yoink protocol. So the idea is, is when you want to have an event, uh, you need to have a lock between your neighbor because you're doing an event near the edge where they could see the results. You just try and grab the lock, which in this, in the case of what I'm implementing now, it means you send a message uh, saying, "I am requesting uh, a lock on this little region, an uh, event window radius of three, because that's what the atom needs." Uh, uh, at location X, Y, whatever it is. Uh, um, but in addition to sending along all the information about the uh, where the event actually is, you also include one random bit. And <clears throat> if the other guy isn't trying to have an event at that spot, then you win. You, just, you, know, you grab the lock, and it's great. Uh, the only case where it's a problem is if the other side was simultaneously trying to grab a lock that was going to overlap, and the two requests cross in the data fabric, cross in communications. And that's exactly equivalent to a one strike three shoot. Uh, um, and if it doesn't happen, see, the key thing about one strike three shoot is we all agree that we're picking sides or we're deciding who's going to bat first or whatever it is. In this case, we don't even have that agreement. We might have both sides trying to have an event, but we might not. So that's where the yoink comes in first. You try and grab it. And it's only if the other guy is trying to grab it too, then that means your request to that guy and that guy's request to you will cross in the fabric and you'll both see them and then you'll have your random bit and you'll have his random bit and you play odds and evens with them. If it's a zero, that's throwing a one or whatever it is. You add up the two bits and if it's even, one guy wins and if it's odd, the other guy wins and you just hard code that. Northwest is odd, southeast is even, that kind of thing. So what happens then is that it doesn't, it's not actually super critical that we be able to uh, resolve the lock situation as quickly as possible. Or at least if we're actually doing this by sending packets, which are going through the, out, the outboard proofs and blah, 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 all that stuff we're working through, as we saw months ago, that's not su super fast. And in fact, we had a special extra hardware that we made to try to make the locking fast. But all of that, I realized a week or so ago, is based on the idea that we have one event window on the tile. And and so when we decide that we are going to do an event window here, and that implies I need a west lock, we block. We say, I want to get the west lock. We need to get the west lock as quick as we possibly can so we know whether we can go ahead with this or not. Uh, um, now, in the way the simulator implements it, if it can't get the lock, uh, then it just drops the whole thing and goes and does something else. But it still has to find out. The lock resolution process has to settle before it can do anything else. So that's what this code is heading for. And, you know, this model where there's only one event window per tile goes all the way back to this paper from 2012. Uh, and I've shown this before with the... Um, uh, uh, 
intertile mutex, mutual exclusion lock try 20 cycles. This was the thing that turned out to be completely unrealistic on the T2 tiles. The uh, lock attempts, even with the special hardware stuff, takes a much, much, much longer than that. And that was one of the reasons to feel bad about how many air or milli air we we're going to get out of these things. However, suppose we had lots of events windows going at once then we could say okay I'm asking for this thing I'll send him a packet and I'll go on other business I'll start another event window over here that needs to have a lock with West and I'll send him a packet and all of this stuff can be going on while I'm doing packets while I'm doing events in the middle of the tile and no problem and so the locking mechanism doesn't have to be super fast as long as we can have enough parallelism in event windows to cover the the latency of talking to the other side so what we need is we need lock packets requests and acts that aren't very big so they don't take up a lot of bandwidth and we need to be able to hold lots of locks all over the place uh, uh, not just one lock for the entire north edge or the entire west edge but specifically I only need this many sites radius 3 around 6 comma 22 whatever it is and that's what we're implementing now, implementing precision locking where you request exactly the sites that you need. And the other side has a, we have an array of all of the sites saying who's locked by who. And we can have up to, right. So as opposed to doing what we did before where, you know, so all of these things in the schematic, everything that ends with LK there, those are the special uh, wires just for locking. Uh, and in, there it was that in, in the MFM simulator, where is it? Oh yeah, there it is. The one and only event window per tile. But what I'm doing now is uh, event window is an array of a bunch of them. The tile has an e max EW slot of them, which is basically 32. That So the way I'm designing it, uh, uh, this tile will be able to originate 32 events that it's doing simultaneously with its neighbors. Uh, I'm sorry, 16 events that it's doing simultaneously with its neighbors and also manage 16 that its neighbors are doing that requires locks on it. 16 for active where it's running the event, 16 for passive where neighbors are running the event all going at once. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's a significant redesign. It means more state machines. But again, doing all of this stuff at the Linux kernel module level and so forth over and over again, doing the state machines, getting it working, uh, gives me a little bit more confidence. We can do it yet again at the event level. That's it. Uh, uh, okay, so I ran long here. But I'm a little bit excited about it. I really want to find out, you know, Number one, is this going to give us some speed up? And I hope it will. Uh, uh, and number two, just, you know, got to get it working first so we can actually see it. Uh, and, you know, there's quite a ways to go here. But I'm not going to be back for two weeks. So the next update will be April 14th, halfway through April. Who knows what the world will be at that point. Let's hope for the best for everybody. I hope to see you in two weeks.